Hi, everyone. Happy Thursday. Um, I am, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started here. So I hope everybody's been having a wonderful day thus far. My name is Celine Tian. I'm the founder and CEO of Flowly. Um, many of you are directly from our Flowly community. If you're not, welcome for our heroes from Flowly. Hi again. So wonderful to see you. I'm actually really excited for this workshop today because we actually have a guest. Um, I just want to remind everybody, this is a safe, respectful space. Um, we're here to share conversations, science, data around health, and in this workshop, specifically around trauma. Um, this is a really, really interesting talk, so I would have all of you go ahead and ask questions, save those questions up or go ahead and type into the chat or there's actually directly a Q&A feature you can ask questions in. Um, today, I'm playing the role of the host. So I'm going to be inviting on stage um, a really, really respected coach in our space who has actually worked with Floli in the past. I've seen her take folks with super high impact chronic pain years and years of being on medication, um, not feeling like they were able to function at their best capacity to in a couple months, really being able to do backflips, going back to work, hanging out with family and friends. So I'm really excited to bring on Jenny. So before I get started, quick context about this workshop. As many of you know, um, trauma is a really serious, a really hard topic to cover because it's so incredibly complicated. However, trauma can come from both seemingly small and large aspects of our lives and our experiences. But whether trauma is, its, is in its micro or macro forms, it can leave a really significant or even damaging impact on us. That's why I was really excited to actually talk about it and really bring more light and awareness around trauma because in so many ways, a lot of us are exposed to trauma or have trauma of our own, but we don't have that space to talk about it or understand the science around it. Um, and a lot of what we do at Flowly is so much addressing and working with people with trauma that I really felt that this was such an important conversation to have. So today I'm inviting Jenny. Jenny Huang is a fellow member of the Institute of Coaching at McLean, affiliate of Harvard Medical School. Jenny is a life coach, a multimedia artist who explores the intersection of psychology, art, and education. Jenny was also the co-founder of Longev Longevity Tech, um, an anti-aging company, as well as the co-founder of NanoCure Technology, a biotech cancer company. Jenny previously studied neuroscience and health policy at Mount Holyoke College, UCLA, Columbia University, and University of Southern California, um, and also University of Pennsylvania, too many schools to count. She's also a former dancer and trained culinary artist. Um, and what I love about Jenny is I think she brings a lot of her sort of interdisciplinary profession and education into her work so that we're really looking at um, things like pain and trauma from all aspects and even about treating pain and trauma um, from a 360 degree kind of viewpoint. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is invite Jenny on stage. She's gonna chat with you guys a little bit about her work, about the science of trauma, um, bring in that conversation. And then we're going to have a little bit of a conversation and Q and A at the end to wrap it all up. So welcome, Jenny. I'm going to uh, invite you on stage now. And then, uh, so Jenny, if you want to unmute and um, start your video. Um. Uh, I've unmuted and I can't start video, I believe. Okay. Let me make you host now. Okay. Thank you for that, Celine. It's so true. Um, all about trauma and it is so important, especially um, now. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, good morning, all Flowly heroes. So the topic today, trauma, um, addressing trauma we don't talk about, understanding its impact and the tools to manage it. Um, we'll try to unpack some of the important issues to what is a very complex psychosocial physiological phenomenon. To talk about trauma properly will take multiple sessions, but today we'll at least begin the discussion, learning ways to increase our awareness and to help us process our emotions, I think will be keys. 
So here I'd like to use the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio's words, we are not thinking machines that feel, rather we are feeling machines that think. So we feel more than we think we think. So feeling involves complex neurochemical mechanisms and trauma initiates all those complex mechanisms involving our body's response to danger in a prolonged way. As we're understanding our brain and body better to improve technology, at, due to improve technology, we're also understanding that trauma is really more multi-factored, both in causes and effects than we used to think. And Jenny, in case you were wanting to share slides, just wanted to let you know the slides are not up yet. Okay, yeah, I do want to want to share slides. Let's see if we can share the screen. Great, I see it. Okay, great. So that was my welcoming slide. Um, and so, yes, that's our topic. We'll try to uh, unpack trauma, the biology, the healing, and even to build resilience. Um, so, so as we understand, as we're understanding our brain and body better due to improved technology, we're also understanding that trauma is really more complex. Um, so I was just saying that to use Dr. Paul Conti's words, he's a psychiatrist out of Stanford and Harvard, and these are his words. I would describe trauma as anything that causes us emotional or physical pain. Pain that surpasses our coping mechanisms, that makes us feel overwhelmed, pain that overwhelms our nervous system, and then really leaves a mark on us as we move forward. And trauma can be acute. So trauma is our body stuck in fight flight um, in that mood. So cortisol goes up, we breathe shallow, muscle tenses up, heart rate goes up, emotions heighten, and trauma is when the event is over, our body's stuck in this maladapted circuitry and continues to experience all the physiological states. Here, I like to distinguish briefly between trauma and stress. Stress from our daily lives can be very taxing but when the event is over, our body is supposed to return to its baseline, um, not the case for trauma. That's not to say that trauma can't come from one event, uh, different events at different levels, so trauma can be acute. It is an emotional response to the event or events. We seem to assume that trauma only comes from extreme events, but trauma can come from many different situations and the damage can leave a significant impact to us and even the loved ones around us. So um, how one develops trauma is different for everyone, depending, that'll depend on multiple risk factors such as genetics, health conditions, availability of social support, so on and so forth. So, but if this trauma goes unseen and it continues to become chronic, it changes our brain biology, affecting our psychology. An example shown here uh, in the form of uh, PET scan images, this is, this is a study done at Yale. Um, it indicates that um, people with trauma have higher uh, receptor um, in quantity uh, called mglu R5. So individuals with trauma uh, versus a healthy uh, patient, overstimulation of this receptor is associated with fear and stress-related behaviors. The study um, is the first to implicate a specific alteration in brain glut glutamate signaling in uh, PTSD patients. So glutamate is a chemical messenger of brain signals, saying though this is telling us that increased brain activity in people living with trauma, so actual evidence. So this study, along with many others, tell us that trauma changes our physiology. This changed physiology induces fear, and the fear can create more trauma, so again, a maladaptive behavior pattern. Studies have also shown that after someone survives a life-threatening situation, their brain functions differently. So when someone has been traumatized, the alarm system in our amygdala, uh, our brain's uh, region for emotion, it's an emotion center, becomes overly sensitive to signs of danger. This is a big challenge for people living with trauma. Triggers can be unpredictable. Hence, at the slightest hint, the 
brain and body is flooded with stress hormones such as cortisol, causing bewildering changes to how we feel and react. As a result, it takes longer for traumatized people to return to baseline and it spikes quickly and disproportionately in response to mildly stressful, stressful stimuli. So there's a story, a case of a woman, for example, who would uh, strangely would throw up or feel extremely nauseated at the sight of something green in a restaurant. And it took a while for um, to figure out, for her to figure out that um, when in childhood, when she was in grade school, a girl sat next to her uh, during lunch, got sick and vomited all over her. That girl was wearing green. And so now at the sight of green in a restaurant, so in that scenario, she feel nauseated. Our brain, how it registers events is very complex. Furthermore, in the long term, the real challenge with trauma is that the constant stress hormones can cause many physiological health problems. For one, the stress hormone of tra traumatized people take much longer to come back down to baseline. And then that will start a whole many more chains of other um, health pathways and, and risks. So yes, trauma can be the result of one acute event, one breakup, one bad public speaking experience, one accident can get our brain to start this maladapted response cycle. What we don't want is for trauma to develop secondary trauma and so on, and that complicates our states. And we certainly don't want to turn it into a chronic clinical situation. So other times it is trauma can be due to accumulation of events accumulation of microtrauma. Our coping mechanisms are weakened by successive microtraumatic experiences that adds up to cause a significant neurological maladaptive circuitry, as mentioned before, that is trauma. There is actually a term for this called long-term potentiation. So living in repeated microtrauma, such as coping with high stress daily, such as unreasonable demanding jobs, caring for sick family members, dealing with a loved one's mental health issues, like growing up, growing up or living chronically in an unsafe environment can all cause long lasting changes. As um, studies of combat soldiers show that for combat soldiers, war is 2% terror and 98% boredom as soldiers wait and prepare for the terror. The waiting is actually doing just as much damage. So it is not just the extreme traumatic event itself that causes the changes in the brain. What goes on before and after the event affects us more, which further explains the complexities of trauma. So experiences like anticipating a negative event or processing afterwards what could have happened, like a near missed accident, for example, this thinking, overthinking, worrying, further reinforces that maladaptive circuitry. So trauma can affect us in many ways, in different ways, and in unexpected times and circumstances. Trauma changes our emotion, and emotions determine our decisions. So trauma shapes our view of the world around us. It will change how we experience events that happen to us. So we can form these reactive circuitries. So when, when the trigger is present, our body reacts immediately. Our brain has been designed evolutionarily to do that in order to protect us for survival, to react rather than process in order to save our internal resources. It's actually a process called allostasis. So we react, we create fear, helplessness, shame, etc. And it grows. Trauma grows, trauma comes from trauma, has to do with the way our brain learns, which is another complex uh, topic. But learning oftentimes, more often than not, takes many repetitions, but some learning can take just one exposure. Trauma causes stress and anxiety and in turn causes unhealthy tension in the body, which is why it's important that we are made aware of these tensions. So we know that it is neurophysiological, so we can process. When we don't notice and we let it pass, it goes to our muscles and other parts of the body, causes pain and cause and et cetera, leading to many health conditions such as cardiac issues, respiratory, skin, hair, type 2 diabetes, fertility, even immunity, digestive, all sorts of um, health issues. And these are there's a lot of studies done on this. 
So it's important to be aware and then to release these tensions. As our brain can learn trauma, it can also unlearn trauma. Our brain can learn safety as it is extremely adaptable. We used to think that nerve connections in the brain become fixed and just wither away as we age. Now we know the brain changes as we learn throughout life. So neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to form new connections, explains why we can rewire our brains to reverse trauma's damaging effects. Our brains, our brains are more susceptible to change than many people think. And even though overcoming trauma is a difficult process, you're actually changing the way your brain works, adding new pathways, increasing the functions of certain areas, and strengthening connections. It's the same mechanism that allows us to grow and change by learning. So during the healing process, you can actually rewire and retrain your brain to reverse the effects of trauma. You can reinforce your prefrontal cortex and get back that rationality and control. You can strengthen your hippocampus and help your memory work how it's supposed to. And you can subdue the hyperactive amygdala, which will help you bring peace and calm. So we now know that the brain has incredible ability to reorganize itself, forming new connections and ridding itself of old ones. And in fact, to rid of old traumatic neurocircuitry isn't enough. We need to replace new circuitry to heal our trauma. And the way we do that is by changing synaptic connections. That is the connection between nerve cells and even to grow new neurons. So new neurons and electrochemical changes and synaptic gaps between these cells. There are different ways. And here's the proof for that neurogenesis, the growing of new neurons. Here's a slide showing of how our neurons grow. So during a post-traumatic episode, we may feel hijacked by our emotions, but we can train our mind and body to manage, to make decisions to process differently, to utilize our brain's ability to make new connections. The way I look at how to train ourselves to manage and to heal from trauma is this bi-directional approach, top down, bottoms up. So top down is awareness, processing, reframing, knowing to initiate using the tools where we've learned to calm down and respond better. So bottoms up is to just start taking actual steps to let our body know that we are not in danger, to breathe deeply, to move, to journal, and in even longer terms, to, prov to provide our body with necessary nutrition, to sleep, to exercise, so on and so forth, so we can cope with stressors of trauma. So healing begins with awareness and processing. First, awareness. And that's hard in our society, because too often we don't talk about trauma or even admit to ourselves about trauma. We feel shame, sense of inadequacy due to social beliefs. It's important to remind ourselves that it is not our failing, but rather a neurophysiological circuitry gone wrong. So we cannot acknowledge our trauma we express it as angst, depression, sadness. So if not processed, trauma can revisit us unexpectedly and can feel very fresh as if it was like yesterday. And that translates to chronic negative states like sadness, trend, and, um, leading to more angst and shame. Emotional trauma can really hurt your relationships as you're all, always waiting for the shoe to drop. If you didn't grow up in a safe environment, for example, you're going to spend a lot of time looking for ways to be safe in adulthood and not have the mental capacity for other more positive activities. Worse, we certainly can also turn to even wor worse paths of self-destruction. So this reflexive fear, anger, shame, further enhances our memory of the trauma and then starts a vicious circle. Because as mentioned earlier, our emotions affect our memory. Our memories also affect our emotions. When we're made aware of what and how we are experiencing events, then we can begin to process. In this process, we begin our healing. We let our body know we are no longer in danger. That's top down. We feel safe in order to extinguish the negative maladaptive signals. 
we resort to our autonomic nervous system to set an optimal stage for processing that's bottoms up then so it's very important after that we replace the old maladaptive circuitry there are many ways to do this certainly we can find a fitting and good therapist um, there are many scientifically proven therapies such as CBT, EFT, ACT, MDR, so on and so forth, but that is not always possible. So here are a few tools we can start implementing, at least experiment, to try to heal ourselves. There has been um, journaling. So there has been a lot of science in the, in the recent years on journaling. Researchers have discovered that inhibiting the emotions of a memory increases the sympathetic nervous system response, that's fight flight, it increases it, um, so resulting in long-term stress. A situation that would normally cause a few moments of danger or frustration can push someone into a rage or a full-blown panic attack. When the stress of trauma is added to everyday tensions, we also become more vulnerable to flare up afterward. So journaling lets our body know that we are not in danger. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting down using a pen with our fingers and writing down our thoughts. That's an actual physical change, letting our body know. And then there's the writing down the processing. Meditation. So again, there's a lot of science there. And um, suffice it to say that there are actual brain changes that shows changes in our brain um, from improving from improvements from meditation. breathing so in breathing exercises we try to achieve heart brain respiratory synchronicity breathe for heart coherence breathe to bring more oxygen to our tissues and organs breathe deeply to increase our vagal tone activating our parasympathetic nervous system for calm so most of us today don't breathe properly and this is what it should look like when our when we give our lungs enough air and enough time for oxygen exchanges with proper breathing our body can fully utilize its own natural healing ability this is proper breathing this is what it should look like engaging our diaphragm helping us to make more room for lung expansion and allow for proper gas exchanges so one important note here is nose breathing. Um, breathing through our nose is going to be key to proper breathing. So in the 22,000 breaths we take on average every day, the reason, so the reason for nasal breathing is multiple. It increases airflow, oxygen uptake, and warms the air coming in, improves lung volume, and most of all, we breathe through our nose for nitric oxide which is a vasodilator and it is produced in the paranasal sinuses. It is a signaling molecule and helps with blood flow and the release of oxygen from our hemoglobin to our cells where we need it. And this um, garnered a 1998 Nobel Prize for physiology and medicine, the research on nitric oxide. So when we continuously release um, into the nasal passageway by uh, nitric oxide, by nose breathing, nitric oxide relaxes our blood vessels, improves blood flow and improves oxygenation where we need it. Because just having oxygen in our body doesn't mean it gets delivered to where it needs needed. The oxygen need to be released from the hemoglobin for that to happen. Nitric oxide, which modulates carbon dioxide to stimulate release of oxygen to cells. This is why I'm uh, highlighting this so much because it is very important nose breathing, um, which is why breathing is so crucial in your Flowly sessions. So as a biofeedback tool, Flowly helps sets an optimal stage for healing. And it induces the relaxed alpha brain wave, for example, bringing heart, brain, and respiration to a synchronization. And it also improves our heart rate variability. So um, here I would like to quickly mention the uh, some long term investments, uh, which are very important, but I'm just going to um, just fly by them. And it is to eat a diverse mix of food at every meal. That's our nutrition, our diet for the nutrition that we need to optimize our body to handle stressors of trauma. So eating diet is very important. Sleep is extremely important. Exercise 
you know, yoga, um, walking, exercise is important, very important. And social support, again, another very important factor, things that we can try to do, talk to a trusted friend, family member, to help us process our trauma, um, to release those tensions. So um, if we heal well, we grow from trauma, we build even res resilience. And the result of practicing all that said about tools, finding the ones that fit us so we can practice it daily, we not only can heal our traumas, we learn from the process and we grow. And I love this, um, this graphic depicting that we actually pain doesn't go away, but we grow around it. So we want to make our bottle bigger. So we upgrade our system. We actually become better because of the stressors, because of our trauma. And um, so we're coming uh, to the end of kind of my slide presentation. And um, as always, I always like to give takeaways because if you remember nothing at all from today, I would like you to remember these three things is awareness, to breathe, and to remember that your brain is plastic and you can change. So in conclusion, I'd like um, for you to kind of explore an overarching idea of allowance, that to heal from trauma is more of an allowing instead of a pursuit to rid of something. So it's allowing for all emotions, allowing yourself to experience all emotions, trusting that they're all good for you and you can feel safe that it's like gently holding something delicate in your palms, that it is a gentle holding of our emotions so we can experience it, holding instead of gripping. Um, for we can only let go of something we're willing to hold. Then you can let go. So um, that's it. If we have questions. So, um... Jenny, do you mind making me a host? I'm gonna jump back on and I can moderate some of the questions we already have coming in. Okay. Um, I already see a lot of questions in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, I, we, we even see some over social media. So go ahead, send in those questions as we do this. But I just wanted to say that that was really, I think a really, great overview of brown trauma and then how to address it. Um, and it's really interesting because it ties into so much of the science that we know from other parts of sort of chronic conditions that are not specifically our own trauma, but let's say around chronic pain or generalized anxiety disorders, etc. cetera. Um, and so this is really interesting because I think that for a lot of people that might come from different backgrounds, you might not necessarily recognize, oh, I have trauma or I um, am experiencing a trigger through your work in addressing other parts of your mental and physical health. You might see that, oh, actually, I might not have been aware of certain traumas I've been holding on into, in my body. And therefore what I'm doing as my practice to address other parts of my life is actually also addressing trauma and addressing the ways that which we can recognize it, um, address it, and then really manage and allow it. Um, and if you're looking for how to make me a host, Jenny, you just, yes, okay. You just click Wait, my uh, name and more here. I will. Oh, there I go. Okay. Perfect. Um, so one thing as the questions are coming in one question i did have which is i know it's a question i've heard from other heroes in the past because as some of you know we've done clinical trials case studies where we work with a lot of people with a lot of comorbidities including ptsd and a lot of trauma and so one question i've gotten often is and i would love to post to you is what should we do if we know we will be in a situation where there where there will be a trigger for the trauma um is this something like we just have to avoid altogether? Is this something I'm like, I have no control over? Should I just go into that situation knowing I'm gonna get triggered or are there any ways that I can start to manage or work through that? Right, so um, I think the, 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 the biggest challenge is when triggers are unexpected. 
So, but if we know that um, we are going into a situation where there might be triggers, that's actually, you know, more manageable. So there are different ways, of course. I, I've uh, recommended, you know, people to, for example, take um, a few minutes before we enter into a situation just to breathe deeply. So then we're accessing that parasympathetic, you know, nervous system to let it calm um there's one trick that i um that's very easy to do that even while before and while we're breathing is to release the tension here between your eyes it's very interesting because there are studies that show that when this muscle here between the eyes is relaxed you actually can't get angry or can't get too angry so um so meaning to release uh, the tensions in your face because that's directly linked to your parasympathetic nervous system. There's a lot of research done on that. So while you're breathing, then you um, access that, release that. Um, another thing you can do is- Oh, sorry, you know, can I double click on that? So are there exercises you can do? Can you like touch your forehead or is it just so like releasing? Because some people might not be aware of how to release that uh, tension in their face. Right. So again, that's an awareness practice. So when you're breathing or when you're just even sitting there, you will be, you will, um, you, you try to access how you that's called interoception. So you need to get better at this. So a lot of times we have a lot of tension in your muscle, like if you close your eyes and you're breathing and you just, you know, ask yourself, where's my tension? A lot of times we go to the shoulder, we go, our shoulder is tense, and that's easy to tell. But a lot of times that tension is in our face. So it is just a, a gentle noticing and then release. So it's a practice. Um, so, and I was gonna say that um, another thing that we, that seems to be very effective for people is to, um, if it's a, a, a stressful situation you're going in, get a piece of paper, a pen, and just write down, like, you know, write down, I'm going, even think simple things like, um, I'm going into this situation and I feel so-and-so, and, -so, and I'm, I'm anticipating so-and-so, but then you can tell yourself, I'm safe. So writing it down, and remember, these are the things you write down, you can tear it up and throw it away. So that even the actual step of writing, tearing it, throwing it away, um, just this quick um, exercise can remind your body that you are not in danger and you are not your feelings. Yeah, and just to add on top of that, this is an act, um, some, a lot of practitioners call it expressive writing. And there's over 1,300 studies um, on the practice of this type of journaling that can actually help reduce anxiety, chronic pain, anger, um, symptoms of trauma. So it's an extremely powerful writing exercise. We could even do a whole workshop really around the different types of journaling and especially going through expressive writing because it is so powerful. So if that's something anybody would like to see, give us a shout. Let us know that's something you're interested in because um, people have really seen outside outsized results for something like expressive writing. But a lot of these techniques that Jenny is bringing up um, things like journaling, like releasing muscle tension, it, muscles in your face. These are not things you might hear from like a provider in your healthcare system or in your clinic that you go see daily because these are not procedures they can bill. So a lot of times these very effective processes and techniques, you can start to weave and layer into your lives to help address trauma. Um, I see people talking about claustrophobia, behaviors, is not talked about because they're not things that people can profit off of. So I really encourage you to look at these different techniques and research and ask us more questions because these are small things that are completely free that you can start to do to layer into your life that make outsized impacts. Um, and I, I want to also wrap up what you were saying, Jenny, on that point about addressing triggers, because I see this question in our chat here. Um, Someone very bravely talked about how they have claustrophobia caused by trauma many years ago. Um, they've not uh, seen a doctor, but things could trigger them for anxiety attacks, prayers help them. Um, but what they're asking, what can I do to stop reacting to certain things that start or trigger me? Yeah, so I think for a lot of phobia um, conditions, there's a therapy called um, exposure. So it's a repeated exposure. That's been very, very helpful for a lot of phobias, um, uh, people dealing with phobias. Um, and again, so the general 
um, the general or you know, overarching theme in all this is again the awareness. Um, so the awareness that you are experiencing it and even tracking how you're experiencing it um, is really helpful so that um, instead of just be being swallowed up by that fear, you know, so start to breathe, start to exhale, start to release that oxygen to all your tissues and then letting yourself know that reminding yourself you're not in danger. Um, and then, you know, um, a lot of times it's that repeated exposure, little by little, uh, will, will help you understand, help your, your body, tricking your body to understand that you're actually, no, 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 no lion is attacking you and you can be safe. Um, yeah, so phobias are uh, complex, but it is definitely all the tools that we have spoken about so far, breathing, meditation for the long run, definitely helps. Yeah. And, and I see Terry, a hero in our community, saying that, um, that there will always be triggers and autonomic responses, but if we can just take a moment to pause, breathe, evaluate the situation, um, it's easy to say, but hard to do, but could be really key to um, be able to address trauma, which I love. Um, and yeah. Terry, I don't know if you learned any of that from your work in Flowly, um, but I hope we've, we've helped contribute to that understanding, because I think that's, that is an amazing insight. And I think it sounds, and I have to iterate, reiterate this point, which is we've worked with a lot of trauma patients and I know it can sound really trivializing to tell you, oh, all you have to do is pause and breathe and evaluate the situation. But I cannot overemphasize how hard that is. That is really, really challenging to do for everybody, especially if you have trauma, especially if you have anxiety, especially if you have pain, and especially if you know or have been triggered. And so these are not trivial things that we're saying, oh, just simply do that. These are really hard, um, powerful tools that will take time and consistency to learn, but you can do it. And with proper guidance and support, you will be able to bring in resources to help you. And, and that's why I want to kind of add to this, uh, another question we got from Michelle in our Q&A, because um, Flowly, for most of you here listening, is, is a big part of your daily lives. And so um, they're asking, does using Flowly count as meditation? So I have my answer to it, but Jenny, you know Flowly well too. What do you think? So the way um, I, I always like to joke that Flowly is kind of like meditation on steroids. <laughs> so because um, meditation is and meditation, not to say it's equal, is not exactly the same. But um, what Flowly does is it takes your body's uh, the signals from your body. And there are many that are not to our awareness. In fact, most of our interoceptions are not to our awareness. And what Flowly does is using those bodily signals and then um, bringing some to our awareness and training our body so that biofeedback uh, sets the stage for immediate relief and also long-term training so that's the way I see it yeah and, the, and one thing I want to say is um, I agree I think slowly it's not the same as meditation they're not one-to-one -one, but often the outcomes can be similar right just because you're taking two different paths, you know, maybe one by car, one by walking, you're still getting to the same destination. Um, but one thing I do want to emphasize in terms of the difference is something that Jenny had briefly touched on in her presentation, which is the bottom up versus the top down approach. And the, the, a lot of the heroes in our community, I know I've talked about it all the time. So I'm just going to briefly go over it for those of you that need a reminder or haven't heard about it. But top down is starting top down, literally from your brain down to your body. So it's things like talk therapy, CBT, mindfulness exercises, you're sort of like intaking and output like a meditation exercise or a therapist talking to you and you're trying to manage how you feel up here to then manage how you feel to the rest of your body. Bottoms up is what it sounds like. It's starting with your body to work your way to your brain to how you feel. So with Flowly, we take a bottoms up approach, which is teaching you how to literally control your heart rate, your breathing, your nervous system in here to then affect how you feel up here. And we find that bottoms up approach, both are important. The bottoms up approach can be extremely helpful because if you have pain, you're experiencing anxiety from a trigger, you have trauma, it's hard to do the top down approach to like, empty out your mind, focus on the mindfulness or the talk therapy. 
bottoms up can take your body to a safe, uh, safe place immediately so that you can be more open to sort of the top down approaches. So that's one way to think yeah. about it as well. Yeah, oh. I like to also just add to that is that um, I like the analogy of kind of a car where you need to service your car, you need to optimize your car performance, you need to take care of this and that, so that when you're behind the steering wheel, um, you know, you can have, you know, you're the, you're the person behind the steering wheel, you know where to steer. And um, so the bottoms up approach is setting that stage, is doing that maintenance, is that long term investment, so that you can't um, drive your car in the optimal way. And I like to add also that um, psychoeducation is very important, the fact that you're all here listening to this, and the more you understand how your brain works, will be that top down approach. So the more you understand understand your brain, how it works, how your physiology contributes to it will bring will increase your awareness and then help with your processing. Great. Um, Evelyn is asking, talk more about how it takes longer to return to baseline from minor stimuli and what that means in practice. So, um, so minor stimuli, meaning like micro traumas, um, little things that can happen that adds up. Um, and um, so a lot of times when we, so people who have experienced extreme trauma have this kind of oh, hypervigilance. So in this, in this brain circuitry, you just, any little trigger, any little response will uh, heighten your cortisol level and other neural uh, chemistry in your body. So we immediately bring up that, and is that something that you can control? Um, you can control how that, how that is initiated, but once that's initiated, your cortisol just comes up and you can, you know, also train to slowly come back down, but all those stress hormones and all those neurochemistry gets very heightened in someone who experiences a lot of trauma and micro trauma and they add up. So one exposure uh, exacerbates the previous because it also has to do with the way our body remembers things, how we learn. So it's quite complex. Again, the awareness comes from education. So the education is very important. Yeah, and I want to add to this, which is, I'm not sure if this was exactly your question, um, Evelyn, but one thing this does remind me of this conversation that um, is in this book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score. And in the research that is listed in there, one of the studies talks about when you have micro traumas, which is, let's say, not a huge traumatic event in your life, but there's small micro traumas, like Jenny's saying, that builds up. You are often less aware of it than, let's say, somebody that went through a giant tra traumatic event, right, in which they're extremely aware of it. And often they are able to seek help faster than those of us that might go through life accumulating these minor trauma, traumatic events, but not knowing that it's there in our bodies, in our brain, and not knowing that we have to address it. So I think that goes back to Jenny's point around awareness and that really starting this conversation is the first step because a lot of us, it is harder to go to go through healing and recovery without first understanding that we do hold these traumas in our bodies and brains. Um, it's not something to be afraid of. It's something to just be aware of so that you can start to address it. And it, and like Jenny was saying, it can lead to real recovery, real healing. So it's really an amazing thing in the long term. Um, Evelyn's also saying expressive writing webinar would be helpful. Great. We'll note that. I'll make sure my team notes that so we can get that scheduled. Um, somebody is asking, how can I deal with PTSD and the subsequent physical and emotional pain? Yeah, I mean, that is, that is, um, a I, long I, answer for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I, I, I always like to think again on top, on you know, next to the top down and the bottoms up approach, I think it's easier to um, I, as you had said previously, to just do. So, you know, start by um, prepping your body for it, for, for one, um, is to eat right. Sleep is extremely important because um, for a lot of people experiencing PTSD, trauma, or just extreme high stressors, don't sleep well. And it's kind of a, a vicious circle, right? The, the more we don't sleep well, then the harder we cope uh, to cope with trauma, and then the, the worse the sleep gets. So, um, and and there are different exercises. Um, breathing is one to help you doing flow. I, I know um, uh, some of my clients have uh, started started flowly and they've reduced or even gotten rid of their sleeping pill, 
skills. So, you know, for example, that's that biofeedback that is in uh, Flowly helps. So sleep is very important. Um, it sets the stage. Um, and then again, you know, constantly be learning and listening because our brain, our brain doesn't learn and most of our brain learns by repetition. So it's not just the one thing that you do, or it's not the, the one thing you do for that month. It's something that you need to think of short term and long term. So, you know, to deal with PTSD and this trauma is a collective of things that we need to do both long term, short term, top down and bottoms up. I know it's it's like that's a, it's that's a like lot a, of things. Yeah. And yeah. so <laughs> one thing I'll, I'll leave you with, which is, I think, a great sort of overview way of thinking about it um, is that pain, physical, mental PTSD, these are different things in many ways. But on the flip side, in many ways, they can be addressed in a similar fashion. The reason being, they are all responses to triggers. And so triggers, when I say that, I mean threats. So whether it's a physical threat, an emotional threat, an actual a threat coming from a trigger that you have experienced before, when your body perceives a threat, it reacts in the same way, which is by heightening your sympathetic tone, your fight or flight mode. So what's the natural way of addressing heightened fight or flight mode? Well, it is by turning that off and then turning on your rest, digest and recovery mode. And that's literally the headline, I would say across what we do at Flowly, which is giving you back control of your nervous system so that when you are in that moment where you feel like you are perceiving a threat and you want to calm down, you're shifting your body on command into that rest, digest and recovery mode your parasympathetic system. There's a lot yeah, so, to address that, but Flowly is one of them, but all the other things Jenny talked about as well. Yeah, so i like to just reinforce um, the just the fact that you understand that you can makes a huge difference because it's empowering um, your your brain to know that you can make decisions to change. And that's di that's different than you know years back when I started my education that the brain doesn't change. Now we know the brain changes. So we can reverse and we can get better. So just that knowledge alone is empowering you. And that goes back to kind of what Celine was saying about you know the medical institution now a lot of times you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it, it helps a lot of patients, but at the same time, it's also disempowering. Um, and all the tools that we are talking about today is also, you know, reminding us that we can um, be our own hero. So we can be that large part that, that takes care of our healing journey. Yeah. So again, understanding and education. Yeah. Um, yeah. One question we did also have is, what sorts of events slash experiences count as trauma? I think they're just trying to understand a little bit more about what trauma exactly is. So uh, earlier I was saying that um, I think most experts would agree that because before it used to be trauma is, you know, like experiencing war, natural disaster, something really extreme. But now as we understand how the brain is, because we're showing um, images and how the how the brain changes actually are reacting to not just uh, extreme cases, but the accumulation of micro trauma, like things happening over and over again, um, has has the same. We see the same brain changes as someone who has gone through an extreme event, and then the post traumatic, um, you know, effects of that trauma. These these are they add up to looking to be the same. And of course, we're un understanding more and more, you know, at, as uh, the research is increasing exponentially uh, due to COVID as well. Um, so yeah, so that so trauma now is, um, as I had mentioned before, is a uh, way more complex, more more multi factored, and it affects us in different ways. Um, I think, and most of all, is that it accumulates, mm -hmm. uh, which is why awareness and processing is very important. Mm -hmm. um, someone's asking, what did you mean by, or talk more about what you meant by past becomes present in your slides? Yeah, so um, because when it's, it has to do with the way our our brain learns, it's um, memory. So, so um, we can relive 
And when we are uh, ruminating in our, our mind, processing what happened, what could have happened, what might happen, and your, it's your expectation and it's your, um, it's your recalling of what happened and how you process it, you can get into that rumination and, you, and that worrying, that fear, that helplessness will bring on the same physiological changes as if it just happened. Um, so you're kind of reliving that past, and that has to do with the way we learn memory. Again, um, we can untrain ours. I mean, we can unlearn. So we can train our body to develop new neurons, new co co uh, connections around what was to create new ones, to upgrade our system, not just to improve. And I'll add to that that the reason we use VR, because I get this question a lot, virtual reality and flowly, combining that with biofeedback is because exactly what Jenny is talking about, um, which is about basically breaking that cycle of uh, catastrophizing um, and then basically creating a new neural connection around safety and feeling comfortable instead of ruminating in the past where that anxiety and that pain lives. Um, virtual reality, because it's such an immersive and high stimulus environment for our heroes that are using it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's, it's able to help you create those new neural connections faster because it's so high stimulus. It's so visual that oftentimes just by one or two sessions, if I tell a lot of our heroes, hey, think about the waves in wave world, the constellations in the sky, the, the sound of the waves on the beach, they can immediately recall that environment and, and their entire body actually responds by shifting into that parasympathetic rest, digest and recovery mode. So creating these high stimulus, uh, experiences around comfort and relaxation consistently in your life is really, really, really important, whether or not you use Flowly. I encourage you to look elsewhere for it if you don't use that for Flowly. Um, yeah, and I, and I like to add that um, this is very different from suppression or repression. So what we really want to do is, that's why processing is so important, is um, to acknowledge and then to we do want to kind of get rid of um, that memory of bad experience and the way we do that is to remind ourselves that we're safe but then to um to replace so the 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 getting rid of by ways of that we are safe and then the other part that don't that i think um we don't talk enough about is that replacement part that that we've been talking about that replacing of the neural connection the changing of the chemistry that's between the neurons, the synaptic gaps, all the neurochemistry that happens. We want to change that and we want it, we want to grow around it. Mm -hmm. So that concept is very important. Yeah. Um, and then I think uh, someone, yeah. Oh, so I was just, yeah, we were probably going to say the same thing. Daniel was saying, uh, kind of like creating positive triggers that trigger relaxation response instead of fight or flight. Yeah, I think exactly. That's a really good way to put it. Um, and then I'll, I'll dumb it down for y'all because I'm not the science person here in the room, but one really good story that someone um, once told me about creating these new neural connections is, uh, it's an ancient story that comes from um, a Native American tribe. And the story is a son asks, a, a grandson is talking to his grandfather and he's asking about this ancient story they have in their family. And it's that every human has two wolves that live within themselves. There is a good wolf and there is a bad wolf. The bad wolf is like feelings of jealousy, uh, the negative nature in us being pessimistic. And then the good wolf is like safety, joy, uh, smiling, connection. And the grandfather tells his grandson that everyone has these two wolves within them that battle. And then the grandson asks the grandfather, well, which wolf wins? And then the grandfather says, the wolf that wins is the one that you feed. And so all of us have these different neural connections within us that some feed the negative, some feed the positive, but the ones that grow are the ones that we pay more attention to. And a lot of times when we're stuck in that cycle of pain and trauma, we pay so much attention to those negative neuro, uh, neuro circuitry that those are the ones that get bigger and stronger. But really what we're doing in Flowly and what we're trying to convey to you here is that you got to spend time feeding and nourishing the positive ones, the connections and the neuro circuitry that are around safety, around hanging out with family and friends that, that bring you comfort and joy around relaxing and sleeping well at night. 
and make those good things stronger. Feed your good wolf within you. Yeah, and I like to add that um, uh, a lot of times people ask, um, but how do I act, you know, before all, I can access all that, which is accessing my, my executive brain, before I can start using the tools, I'm just like too overwhelmed, you know, I am like in this rage or in this sadness, I can't, how do I even begin? And I always say to remember that studies show that it takes six seconds. So um, awareness is one key. When you're aware, you're made aware of what you're experiencing, the extreme emotions that you're experiencing, it takes six seconds on average to calm your brain down so that you can access that executive thinking part and then you start applying the tools. So just remember, give myself six seconds, six seconds, say nothing, be calm, breathe, and then just let it. And so that's why I always say it's an allowance. So you allow for whatever it is you're experiencing so that you feel you can access that safety and the tools. I think that's a really great place to wrap up. I'll just end by saying thank you so much, Jenny, for joining us today. Um, I hope everybody found at least one or two takeaways um, that they could bring into their lives. And if you have any questions, please, please reach out to us. And I just want to do one quick plug, which is that slowly just drop Cosmos World. If you haven't tried it, it's beautiful. It's like amazing. I would love for you guys to try. Give us the feedback. Um, tell us how you feel in Cosmos World. Our team spent a long time building it. And um, we also have limited, uh, limited time t-shirts that are women's, men's cut. You can actually request what cut and what size you want. We only have a couple left. Um, you use your Flokins to redeem it. So it's just you just redeem it based off of your work and flowly. Go to your rewards tab and try out and go claim your um, Cosmos Worlds t-shirts and try out Cosmos Worlds. I'm super excited. Um, oh, someone's asking, will the new headset be coming out soon? If you're talking about the new headset with the bigger nose um, space, yes, it's coming. We spent a long time building it and um, we have our final mold that we're testing this month. So we're hoping to be able to launch it in the next two months. Super excited about it. Um, Thank you all for joining and I hope to see you at our next workshop. Thank you. Thank you.